So what can we say about Italian American studies? A lot. However, we have to notice one thing. Sociologically and historically, Italian American studies is fairly old. It's developed probably, we can say, the last 50, 60 years. There's been a lot written by the sociologists and by the historians. And we can see that when we go into the catalogs of the libraries and look at whatever catalog we're looking at, the old OCLC or the New World Cat. Where Italian American studies is young is more on the cultural side, and that is with regard to literature, with regard to cinema. It, I, I always find it, even today, after 25, 30 years of great sort of uh, critical production with regard to Italian American studies, I always find it interesting that the first book on Italian American literature came out in 1974. And what we learn there is that the sort of tradition of Italian American literature is really strong from 1885 on, even though our first novel we can date back to 1835. So when you think about it, 1885 to 1974, it took 90 years before we got a first legitimate study of Italian American literature, and it was Rose Basile Green's The Italian American Novel. And then in between, we had to wait another 22 years before Fred Carter Fay's Italian Science of American Streets was published. So, I, in the meantime, though, there were people who were writing essays. Helen Barlini did the anthology, the dream book, Rob, and, and published essays herself. Robert Viscusi published a couple of really important essays back in 1979, the early 80s, that became fundamental. But it's, I always find it fascinating that we had to wait so long for books, that, for uh, bookland studies on Italian American literature. And that's it. Italian American cinema, the study of Italian American cinema, is even younger. And those books really start at the end of the 90s, beginning of 2000. And we only have about eight or nine books on Italian American cinema. So, um, so we're very young from a critical point of view, which in some ways is good, because we have a lot still to do, and so there's still a lot of work left for us. What about, uh, so, so what about Italian American studies within the academy? It's still not a good situation in this sense. While people have been teaching courses on Italian American studies and they've been doing them as special topics in the university, only in 2012, the end of 2012, were courses formalized in the United States. I'm happy to say that it was at Queens College with Fred Gardafay and I would put together four courses, a bouquet of courses, and they've been formalized. So we have courses that are Italian American studies. On this side of the ocean, in Italy, we have a similar situation. And this is what some of us find very paradoxical. Here we are in Italy, and there are some individuals have done some great things with regard to Italian American studies, especially our historian friends. But Italians don't study the history of Italian Americans, or of Italian hyphenates anywhere, which I find very fascinating. Um, and that subject, obviously, is for another interview, not for this one, another conversation, and not for this one. But what is great is that we finally begun the conversation. We began it informally with some other universities. We began it formally here at the University de la Calabria. Why? Because we have now the first course, CLIA, Cultura e Letteratura Italiana Americana, the first course institutionalized, formalized, whatever adjective we want to use, where it is a standard course within the curriculum of Italian American studies in Italy. It's at the forefront. University of Calabria, and that becomes, uh, puts itself at the forefront with regard to Italian American studies. Now, one other thing. Language. Language in two sense, two manners. We live through language, people say, right? Descartes said, cogito ergo sum, and from Derrida on, they would say, lo por ergo sum, I speak, therefore, I am. And I think language becomes very important in, as far as identity is concerned um, and as far as where, how are we going to catalog writers because not that we should catalog but the system requires that we catalog them. Alright, so we respond to the system. So what is, an, what is a hyphenated writer in Italy and what is a hyphenated writer in America? Now, with regard to Italian American studies in America, we have an issue to some degree. If you write in English, you're an Italian American writer. But if you live, and, and therefore you belong, at least from an Italian perspective, to an American canon or an American tradition. If you write in Italian and you live outside of Italy, you really find yourself 
in an interstitial space where you are really neither nor. And unfortunately, you're much more neither nor as opposed to both and. And that's one of the issues with regard to the Italian writer in the United States. Who is that person? How do we categorize that person? What tradition, to what tradition does that person belong? What do the Italians think of the writer who lives in the States and writes in Italian? Historically, zero, nothing. Um, the course at the University della Calabria will obviously take that into consideration. We have now sort of broken into a couple of places. Um, the very Italian studies journal, Studi Italiani, Italian Studies of the University of Florence, has this year opened up a section of their journal entitled Oltre Confine, dedicated to the writer who writes in Italian, who lives abroad. And I think that these are some sort of fissures, some cracks that um, are opening up uh, within this sort of giant collective that we can call Italian literature here in Italy. And, and those are some good, good um, uh, what can we say, those are, um, and you're going to edit this out for me. <laughs> those are some really first steps, some great first steps with regard to um, a, Italy, the, the sort of collective imaginary in Italy, recognizing the writer who lives abroad and who writes in Italian. So that's good. Um, but I think Italy still has, to, uh, still has to interrogate the notion of the writer in another country who writes in that local language, but yet writes about his or her Italian culture. And that really needs to become part, in my opinion, needs to become part of this greater thing called Itali Italianistica, because Italianistica right now, when you say it, it's literature, it's philology, and it stops there, and nothing else. Now, one more thing. Who is the hyphenated writer in Italy? What do we do with those writers who have come from mostly Africa, North Africa, or the east, eastern part of Europe, who come to Italy, and at its, after five, six, seven, whatever, adopt Italian? Who are they? Who are they when they adopt Italian? Or who are they when they continue to write in their na natural native language? Who are these people? And that I think is something that Italy still has to sort of deal with. Um, and by interrogating the Italian-American situation or the Italian-Canadian or the Italian-Australian or the Italian-Argentinian or the Italian-whatever hyphenate situation, it might help also to open up a perspective to um, enlarge horizons, broaden horizons here in Italy with regard to the hyphenated writer who lives in Italy. And with that, I say buona lettura. So the subject is Italian-American identity. We're in a theater. What better place to talk about Italian-American identity? Okay, so what do I mean by that? We basically are like actors on stage sometimes, we Italian-Americans in the United States. Um, and, and so uh, we, we've, we've grown up thinking that we're Italian. Um, we sometimes exaggerate and pantomime a lot about who we are. And, and we find out when we're an adult that we're Italian-American, that we're not Italian, we're Italian-American. Or we come to Italy thinking we're Italian and we tell people, they say, well, who are you, blah, blah, blah. And we say, well, I'm an Italian. And they say, no, you're not, you're an American. And we sort of find out who we are uh, when we come to, to the United, to, to Italy. Okay, <clears throat> but basically, in a more serious, uh, some of the more, the more serious side of the argument of what is Italian-American identity, it's something that I think finally we're exploring today. It has taken a long time. It has taken about four generations, I think, of, of scholars to finally figure out that there's this thing called Italian-American identity. And we're trying to figure out really who we are with regard to the United States, with regard to America, with regard to the American par excellence, who would be the so-called white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, and who we are as quote unquote Italians with regard to Italy. Um, the Italians see us as Americans, the Americans see us as Italians, especially if we have grabbed on in some way, shape, or form to our, uh, 
Italian heritage, let's say. Um, so uh, only recently, I would say, in the last four or five years, have we really tried to, as we say in the academy, interrogate this issue. And it's been very interesting because we at the Calandra Institute have decided about three or four years ago to begin questioning what is this uh, Italian-American identity um, with ILICA, Italian Language Intercultural Alliance. And what is very interesting is that the president and founder uh, of ILICA, Vincenzo Marra, uh, has set up a, a structure in which the last three or four years we've had four Italians and four Italian-Americans, four uh, uh, journalists and scholars from Italy, and four uh, Italian-American scholars and writers, uh, creative writers, who have talked about this. And we've done four or five already. We have a little book that just came out called Meditations on Identity. And, and, and we're really sort of exploring um, to see who we are within this greater paradigm that we call Americana. And I think we're finding in, to quote Donna Chirico, one of my colleagues and friends at, the, at CUNY and at the Calandra Institute, that while maybe physically we look white, perhaps behaviorally we're not. We don't follow that paradigm, that behavioral paradigm that is white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, even though the WASPs are um, becoming more and more of a minority in the United States with um, really the Hispanics sort of taking over both number and linguistically in some ways. We, we, we jokingly say that Spanish is our second language, but I think we have to stop saying it jokingly and come to the realization that it is very much the second language of the United States. So let's talk about terminology. Let's talk about Italian American studies. Um, we can talk about it historically, we can do that a little bit, but we can talk about it also from the point of view of terminology, right? So who are we as Italian Americans? We sort of try to figure out who we are, and we figured that out a little bit before. But how do we call ourselves? And, and that's really important. You know, I always use the expression, lo cor ergo sum, I speak different, I am, we, we live through language. So, my feeling is that we, um, we really need to use the entire term, Italian-American. Forget Italo-American, forget Italo-Americano and Italian, forget all of that stuff. Because while it may seem like an exaggeration, when we say Italo as opposed to Italian, we are basically being lazy. We don't want to add that extra syllabus, right, of Italian as opposed to Italo. Actually, when you think about it, it's a type of diphthong that we add. So it's a half a syllable, not even a full syllable. All right. So I sometimes tell the non-Italian Americans in the United States that they're being lazy when they say Italo. And by being lazy, they are also willy-nilly sort of disparaging uh, my cultural heritage by not saying Italian. They say Italo. Why? Franco. Why? Why can't we say French? And so on and so forth. Hispanic, whatever. Why can't we be more specific and say Puerto Rican American or uh, Mexican American, etc.? Why do we have to always find these abbreviations or shortcuts, right? So that's one thing. Um, and so uh, when, when we use these two terms, um, I think we need to also think about that little diacritical mark that goes between, that's called the hyphen. Then, in a sort of tongue in cheek way, but being also serious, I decided to use the hyphen as a pretext to talk about what I just mentioned about who we are, um, where are we within this greater c context of American society, et cetera. And I said that, and I'm using the hyphen, uh, all, again, metaphorically, I said it, it divides us. While the hyphen is a unified diacritical mark, it is also a divisional um, diacritical mark because it doesn't bring the two terms together, but it keeps them separate. And while that interstitial space that it creates can be something that is a privileged space, it can also be something that is negative. And so I said, let's bring the two terms together and let's take the hyphen, let's leave the diacritical mark, which grammatically we need, according to Strunk and White, grammatically we need, and let's turn it on its side. And if we turn it on its side, we bring the two terms closer together. Now, I say that a little bit tongue in cheek, but I say it also seriously. Because I think that in, a greater, in the greater scheme of things, we do need to bring these two terms together. We need to bring these two terms together 
on the American side, the United States side, and we need to bring these two terms together on the Italian side. The uh, greater American society needs to know more about Italians than what they know superficially from what they read in the, what they've read in the papers and what they continue to read in the papers, and what they continue to read or what they've read before and what they continue to read as far as the so-called satirists are concerned also as we've been satirized throughout the, the last 130 years. And, the, and on this side, the Italians need to know more about us than what they've read by the likes of Prezzolini and Cecchi and Soldati, and even Calvino in his posthumous um, diary, Irenita Parigi. So, um, so how, how are we doing that? Well, one way is that the University, Università della Calabria, from which I speak, has opened up a course, has institutionalized a course called CLIA, Cultura Letteratura Italiana Americana, and look how prescient they are for the future Italiana Americana, as opposed to Italo Americana. Um, and here we are with the first course institutionalized in the history of the Italian university. Personally, and professionally, I find that paradoxical, but it is a sweet paradox in the sense that finally, on the institutional level, somebody in Italy has taken, has um, begun to pay attention, has taken a serious look at Italians in America and their children and grandchildren. So in the United, so while I am a, um, uh, a a mongrel in the United States, being an Italian American, being uh, you know of a family that came late in in the history of the United States uh, to the United to um, from Italy, I'm also a sort of mongrel when it comes to being an Italian American in the sense that my mother's side comes from northern Puglia, a little town called Faeto, where they still speak a French Franco Provençal dialect. And instead, my father's family comes from east of Rome in the area called the Ciuceria, from a small mountain village in, uh, called Sette Frati, that if you're not from that area, you don't know where it's from. It's basically in the area of Sora or Frosinone. Those are the two towns that uh, people outside of that area can identify and therefore know where I'm from. And, and they both, both of my, my parents and most of my aunts and uncles were born in the United States. Um, they uh, uh, grew up there with, uh, to, uh, two sets of very Italian parents, very Italian on my mother's side. My mother's side, they were very Italian. My grandmother really never learned to speak English. My grandfather did. My grandmother basically was a homemaker. She had 11 kids. They had 11 kids. Nine of them grew up to be adults. Two died very young. And um, she basically communicated in dialect with her children. And as far as we were concerned, she had this sort of broken English, but she was barely functional. I would almost say not functional in English. Um, instead, on my father's side, they, were, they very much in, inserted themselves into Americana or into the American way of life. Although my grandmother had a dress factory, and she was not only of the quality of the work she did, but she was also known for being the woman who brought Italians over, especially during the 20s and 30s. She would sponsor them from Italy during that sort of uh, second phase of generation after the great wave of generation. And then my grandfather worked for Consolidated Edison, which is the electric company of, the, of New York. And so they were pretty much sort of middle class, whereas my mother's side was more working class. Um, and uh, we uh, were, there were a lot of us as far as first cousins. There were something like 25 of us on my mother's side who were first cousins. Nine kids, they had kids, and so there we were. Um, I'm one of the youngest, actually, because my oldest uncle on my mother's side was born in 1899. My mother was the youngest. She was number 11. She was born in 1920. And so I'm one of the youngest first cousins. I was the third to go to college of these 30 cousins. I was the second to get a master's degree. And I think I may be the only PhD still. Um, <clears throat> instead, on my father's side, there are very few of us. There are about seven or eight of us, nine of us. And most of us of my generation, we went to college. Not all of us, but most of us did. Um, and the others who didn't, they did very well uh, because they started a trade early enough 
in the 60s and when do working uh, when a college degree wasn't necessary to get a good job and to really do well. Um, we had a very strange relationship with Italian culture. It was on the one side they knew about high culture in Italy, on the other side we didn't speak much about high culture in Italy and um, it was uh, it was a household that spoke about being Italian, uh, about being proud of being Italian, but we didn't necessarily speak about the specifics of what it meant to be Italian. We just knew we were Italian. And a lot of it was behavioral, uh, the way we, a lot of it was culinary, what we ate, behavioral, the way we ate, that is when our meals were spread out during the day. And my grandmother on my mother's side, the, my, my Pugliese grandmother, actually had the, the proverbial Italian garden with the one fig tree that we used to lay down in the winter and cover with for the winter <laughs> and she had tomatoes <laughs> and she had a peach tree and she had a cherry tree and we also had a pergola. We had um, uh, grapes and my grandmother made wine. The Pugliese side made wine and so in that sense we were very still working class or campagnola um, and, uh, and every, f every fall I can remember as a kid my grandmother made wine, whereas on my father's side, my grandfather went out and bought wine. <laughs> So what do we have to say about the future of Italian-American studies? Easy. There's, I think there's a great future. I think that the future of Italian-American studies is both in America, obviously, makes sense, but also I think in Italy. I think that the future of Italian-American studies is going to be coming at us from both sides. As the Italians become more pluralistic in their thought pattern, as society itself already is rather much more pluralistic today than it was 30 years ago. And as the United States finally comes to terms with the fact that we are indeed a hyphenated country, uh, that while there is still this notion of uh, wasdom, as we sometimes say in English, that is the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant mode of thought, even there things have changed. We have become much more pluralistic. And so with this pluralism, I think we can take advantage of it. We can jump onto the wave of pluralism and we can say that there are also we Italian Americans who have our own unique aspects and qualities that have created, that have added to what we can call Americana. And I think that uh, Italy finally today, in spite of the fact that, this is another, I'm going to open a parenthesis here, in spite of the fact that Italy is the only country in the world with representatives abroad and has all sorts of organizations abroad that represent quote unquote Italians that little by little that wall also is crumbling and that they're also looking at the hyphenated Italians now with an interest whereas 30, 40 years ago they did not. Um, and I think the whole issue, we know that in the early 90s there was sort of a revival of the so-called Southern Question, the Persona Meridionale. I think that that revival is also going to be not only the Questione Meridionale, but perhaps the Questione Italica, to use an adjective, and I use that adjective purposely here, with all of its pregnancy of meaning and historical meaning, that there will be, uh, that Italy really has to interrogate itself as socially from the point of view of what it means to be an Italian in 2014, in 2024, and so on and so forth. So I'm, my salutation to everybody here is buona lettura, buon proseguimento, as we live on the hyphen and we dance actually on the hyphen, whether it be in the United States or whether it be here in Italy. And I'm going to end with saying, not on the peninsula as some people say, but in Italy which is made up of 20 regions, which includes two big islands, and of course one known as Sardinia and the other one known as Sicilia. And with that I say ciao.